All right, so even in the midst of the Mexican-American War, the fixation in the East about the war is, you know, whether slavery is going to go out into the West or not. And <clears throat> Polk doesn't get it. Polk's like the only guy in America who doesn't understand why everybody's worried about slavery with regards to westward expansion. Because he's thinking, look, it's not about that. But, you know, like, yeah, maybe there's going to be, we're going to have some slaves out there, whatever. But he's thinking, no, it's just about adding territory, right? But everybody else is like, no, actually, the real question is whether the slavery will be allowed to go out there or not, okay? And so you have uh, Northerners <clears throat> who are either true abolitionists, right? They see slavery for the moral evil that it is, or they're just anti-slavery because they think it's like backwards, saying <clears throat> the war is an excuse to move slavery out, outward, out west. And you have even those in the South sometimes, there's a Georgia newspaper, for instance, that says, look, the expansion of slavery into the new territories is going to allow the Southerners to um, kind of consolidate power and have, be, remain influential in the United States. So both sides are really recognizing the importance of the question of slavery and see, um, you know, the, the, the question of whether it's going to expand or not into these new territories as the central question of the Mexican-American War, okay? So those who don't want slavery going out into the West, uh, they propose or, you know, uh, buy into something called the Wilmot Provis Proviso. This was like an, an addenda on a bill to provide money for the war in 1846 that said all the territory out west is going to be free territory, free soil territory, no slavery allowed out there in these new territories. And it's proposed um, by David Wilmot, who I believe is a Democrat. He's a northern Democrat. And I don't think his deal is he's not like a really like an anti-slavery abolitionist guy, but he's annoyed at the extent to which the Democrat, the Southern Democrats have hijacked the Democrat Party, okay? And it's all about promoting the slave interest now. That's what the Democrat Party seems to be all about. And he's trying to, like, re-energize the Northern wing of the Democrat Party. And, of course, the Whigs also jump onto the Wilmot Proviso because they're more consistently opposed to slavery. They're not always abolitionists or anti-slavery people, but they tend to be more like that, right? Um, and so uh, the Wilmot Proviso, Proviso is... Uh, so the significance this, of this Wilmot Proviso is that it shifts uh, like the conflict away from the party conflict between Democrats and Whigs and shifts it to this conflict between North and South. Because now you have Northern Democrats who are allying themselves with the Whigs against the Southern Democrats who want to promote slavery out in the West, right? So now what was primarily a party conflict is now geographics, North versus South, because of this Wilmot proviso. And those who support it, like they could kind of be divided up into three categories. Those who are truly abolitionists, right? They see slavery as morally evil. Those who see it as kind of backwards, right? Or those who uh, kind of want to limit the influence of the slaveholding uh, people, the white slaveholders. So, you know, there's different groups of people that, that want to limit or contain slavery. They're not all abolitionists, but they're, but they're allying with each other in this proviso. But they do agree, they, ten they tend to agree, the people that support this proviso, that people, that free labor, as they call it, labor that is, you know, you're paid a wage, right? That that's better. It's in the sense, not just of being more ethical and, and good because you're not abusing people, but it's more good for the economy because people will work harder, they'll be motivated, there'll be an incentive there to work because there's a wage, there's a, re there's a reward there. And that, that's, you know, so they, so whether or not they are abolitionists, they should be, but whether or not they are, they are criticizing slavery and saying that it's a disease. There's something wrong with it, right? And the Southerners really pick up on this because now it's like a critique of their whole way of life and as, well, their whole economy, right? And as we talked about already, the, the great wealth that is being generated by cotton means that they have to double down on their support for slavery and they have to try to say it's a good thing, it's a 
justifiable thing, not just a justifiable thing, but a good thing. So whereas in like the, the earlier periods um, <clears throat> of the late 18th century and the early 19th century, it was not uncommon for Southerners and even for slaveholders like Jefferson or Washington to recognize the evil of slavery. And to, but also at the same time that they recognize the evil of it to say that they're not ready to get rid of it yet. That was not uncommon, right? So even though that's a horrible thing to do, not to end the slavery, not to free your slaves, they were willing to say it was evil. By the time you get into the 1840s, the slaveholders can't say it's evil anymore. They want to have to say it's good. Okay, and they and they they are perceiving any criticism of slavery as an attack on them and their honor. Okay, so it's getting it's a really just kind of depraved situation. All right, for the southerners, yeah, a lot of them, the ones that that are like the, supporting slavery in this way. All right, so then that becomes kind of the central issue here as it relates to this Wilmot proviso, which fails. It passes in the House and it fails in the Senate. Okay, the Wilmot proviso. So the question is unresolved of, of how slavery is going to, uh, what it's going to do out in the West. And some are saying, well, well, we may, well, maybe it just needs to follow the lines of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. So if it's below the 36, 30 parallel, then it'll be a slave territory. If it's above that, it'll be free. We'll just expand that further out into the West. Okay. Well, you have most of the Southerners supporting that idea. You have Polk also supporting it. But you have some Southerners like... John C. Calhoun, this guy from South Carolina who's been around for a while, right? We talked about him really becoming kind of the main advocate for the slave owners in the midst of that whole tariff debacle back uh, with uh, in the late 1820s, 1830s. Um, and uh, he's kind of saying the whole idea that you would limit slavery uh, along these lines, he does, he's coming on out kind of against that, right? Um, but he's more of like an extreme guy, right? So the idea is they're gonna they're gonna <coughs> expand the uh, what you call it expand the um, lines of the <coughs> Missouri Compromise out west, but the the Whigs block this in the um, and those who support it the Wilmot Proviso block this in Congress because they say that's not good enough either. So they're they're kind of coming to this like uh, impasse here in the late 1840s where the real central question for politics is slavery and whether it's going to be allowed to expand into the Western Territory.